I did have family show up. I was afraid that was a bad omen for the rest of you. Um, Cruel joke, Carter, getting my hopes up like that. A lot of times if I were to speak, I don't remember it after. So he said, closing prayer. I go, wow, that went smoother than ever. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but hoping my voice will hold out, I've shortened this up a bit. So hopefully that means I'll at least make it on, on the time I should be done here. So. We've been, our theme for the year, looking at one another. And today we'll be looking at love one another. And looking at John, I'm not sure which I was supposed to do. It doesn't matter. They both say love one another. 1 John 4 and verse 7, or 1 John 4 and verse 11 we're going to look at both of them, so um, we'll look at that all together, so that that should work. Beautiful passage, not that long, so let's read it again. Thank you for that good reading, and thank you, Carter, for the excellent selection of songs. 1 John 4, beginning in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that he, we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You say, well, didn't Todd just speak on love? Yes, he did, and he did a great job. And didn't Sam Robertson do a great job of reminding us of love as he talked about the importance of love and how it should overcome race and should overcome um, any economic differences that might be between us and the importance of our caring for the needy and yes and they did a great job and I sure hope anything I have to say does not detract from that and I hope I can add a few things but I was a little concerned about that but by the time I was done Preparing my few remarks here this morning, it occurred to me we should be talking, we are talking about love every time we give a sermon because that's what God's word is. It is love as we'll be talking about here as God wants the best for us and he tells us how to live this life in his word and so yeah, we're always looking at God's great love in every sermon that we have. <clears throat> so two parts to this, and hopefully the first lays out some of the things for the second. But first, I, in looking at these five simple, beautiful, beautiful, important verses, the first thing I wanted to do was to take a moment and get on my soapbox and go to verse 8 because I think there's a lot of potential for people to misuse this verse and I think we see it misused all the time. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. We were designed and made in the image of God, Genesis 1.26. But I guess it's just an attribute of human arrogance that mankind seems to have a tendency to want to make God in our image. And so there's a great tendency in the world, I hope we don't have it, a great tendency in this world to want to read this passage as 
love is God, which is not what it says. So we want to read this, love is God, and then say, well, you won't believe how many romantic novels I've read and how many romantic comedies I've watched that Hollywood put out. And so, yeah, I know when the music soars and I know when people's eyes get misty and, oh yeah, I know what love is. So let me tell you what God is then and what God believes and what God feels. And so we want to use our cloudy human vision to try to put God in a box of what we think love would be from the things we picked up from the world. And of course, we're warned against this in Isaiah 58 and 8 and 9, where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We do not know lo love and what it truly means without God telling us what love is. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Verse 7 tells us that love is from God. So God is the source of love, and he gets to define love and instruct us on the true meaning of love, not the other way around. But still, people, being people, they want to define God in our own image. And so we keep finding people going back and saying, oh, yeah, I know love, it's that gushy, warm feeling in my stomach. And yeah, love, love would not allow God to send people condemn people no matter how just it is to, to hell or we see in the news the world's religious leaders who seem to be wanting to draw closer to sin and saying things like as you may have heard recently oh there's good in all relationships so sinful relationships we might need to find a way to tolerate them and while it is true there, there are valuable souls in every relationship, as you've heard many times from this podium, sin is never the answer. And so sinful relationships are not loving. Love, agape love, is acting in the eternal best interest of others as God has done for us and as we should be doing for others. And so to engage in sin with other people is not, no matter how great your intentions may be, it is not loving another person. Loving is acting in their eternal best interest. Very similar to this thought is we also frequently hear people say, oh, I know what God's word is, but I know, I know God. Not that I've read that much of what he had to say, but I know God, and God wants me to be happy. And so, yeah, his word says this. But he wants me to be happy, so I'm going to set aside his word because that's what I want. God loves you. He has instructed us in, in what is best for our <coughs> eternal lives. He is love. He knows how we are supposed to live. His word is the perfect instruction on how we are to live our lives. And then back to verse 8 again. God is love. Love is the very nature of God. He's the source of love. He defines love. I love basketball. I love blackberry cobbler. And it's my birthday week. I probably will get some. But we're talking about true agape love here. Wanting and doing the best for one another. 
And as we'll be reminded as we go along throughout this short talk, God is the perfect example of love, and we can come to an understanding of love only by looking into his word. We must turn to God to understand what love is and how we are to love one another. And so what I'd like for us to do is go through these seven verses here in just a second and look at what we learn from God's word. But first, a couple of more thoughts on God's revealed word and his love for us. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 24, it says, So the Lord commanded us to follow all of these statutes, to fear the Lord our God. Why? So the Lord commanded us to follow all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our own good, for our own good always, and for our survival as it is today. Our God, who is our creator, who knows why we were created, what our purpose is, what is ultimately good for us in this life and the life to come, has given his statutes, his directions, that we can know what love is, we can know how we are to live. God's word is to direct us in our best interest. It is love. 2 Peter 3, 9 states, The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Our Father loves us. He gives us the best direction in his word. He wants us to spend eternity with him in heaven. And in fact, as we'll note, stated here again in a few verses, he willingly gave his son to die in our place when we did not deserve it, that we might spend eternity with him. And then he gave his word to direct us in this life that we might know true love. So let's consider the nature of God and his love for us and what our love needs to be for one another as we look at these five short verses here. <clears throat> so 1 John 4, verse 7. And 7 and 8 I've already touched on a bit. We'll be shorter there. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Once again, love is the essential nature of God, and he is the source of love, and the only way that we can know what true love is is through his revealed word. It all begins and ends with God. Verse 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love is his very nature. It's why he created us. It's why he sent his son that we might be saved. And if we do not love, and we'll look at a couple of tests of that in the upcoming verses here, if we do not love, we do not know or love God, we're not following his example and not filling the purpose of our creation. Verse 9, get into some more specifics here. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. A couple of points from that. God provided what we needed. He sacrificed his Son. He did what we could not do. He filled our greatest eternal need. God acted and acted in our best interest that we might live. True agape love is acted upon and sacrificial. It's through our learning to love and following our Savior's example that we go from being selfish to selfless. We learn to act in the best interest of others, their eternal best interest. 
We've talked about this recently. Todd has covered this, and so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But God acted for us. 1 John 3, 16 and 18. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. As we've noted recently, love is far more than warm, fuzzy feelings or platitudes. Hope you're doing well. Love is self-sacrificing and getting busy and doing and acting in the best interest of our brother or neighbor. We must act and serve one another not just say nice things about one another. We must act if we are to love one another. And then verse 10. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not only did God act in our best interest, he act, acted first. He initiated the love. He initiated the action, the sacrifice to save us and acted in our best interest. It's not that we loved him. It's not that we were lovable. God loved us when we were unlovable, when we had separated ourselves from him by our sin. And here's where I want to stop for a second and reflect of whether or not we're actually reflecting <coughs> and imitating God's love because I'm afraid it's so easy for us. It is for me. It's so easy for us to use the wrong standard to evaluate ourselves. Self-deception is so, so easy. And so I want us to stop and think about this a little bit. Are we initiating the love? Oh, I love so many people. I'm doing such a great job. I have family in this group. I love, I love those people. I'm doing a great job. I love, love my family. There are people here from Kentucky and Ohio. And so we can talk about going to jungle gyms and we can talk about the beautiful green fields of Kentucky and so I'm naturally attracted to them. There are people here who have done great things for my children. And so Ryan and Jenny, they used to babysit my children, and Jonathan did as well. And Jenny, Wes's sister, babysat my children, and Amy babysat my children. I love these people. I'm doing so well. And some people have helped me haul hay for my animals, and some have helped me with plumbing, and some have helped me in oh so many ways. And how could I not? I love these people. And 27 years ago when I moved into my house, well, as we're moving in, Jerry Bonin made sure the beds were set up. So after that long day of moving, we had a, had a bed to fall into there and everything. And how could I not? So many people. Uh, there are people here that my brother told me, hey, these people are coming. Ann and John and Timothy, yep, these people are coming. You're going to love these people. They're great people, good Christians. And yep. I love those people. So there are so many people that have done so much for me and who I have so much in common with. And I tend to self-evaluate myself and go, wow, I'm doing great on this love thing. I love these people. 
I'm doing a great job. But to more accurately assess my love as it relates to how God loved us, let us consider Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of God who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, do they not the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles, do they do not the same? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And how does the heavenly Father love? He initiates love. He loves those who have not done anything for him, not those who loved him first. He loves those who are hard to love, those who have separated themselves from him and has even given his son for them. I may soothe my conscience by saying, look at all these friends and family members I serve and I love them so well, but if I'm to be a verse 45 son of the heavenly father and show true love, I must serve and love those who are not naturally lovable to me. There will be those I run into in life who did not come from Kentucky. There will be people who want to talk about cricket, don't know, and not basketball. There will be people who have a different race, have different economic status. And thank you, Sam, for the great lessons along these lines. There will be those who speak different languages, in my case, language, different language than I do. There will be those who don't have Spurs tickets falling out of their pockets. People who don't even have a truck I can borrow. Probably people who don't enjoy my corny jokes. And there will be young people who don't find a lot of interest in an older person and who probably don't want me to hear me tell about six miles to school and back in the snow uphill both ways. <laughs> I'm not that interesting to them probably. But true love, as we've seen, as God demonstrated toward us, is acting into the best interest of those who I don't know that well, who are different from me, who don't display great love to me. And yet, if I'm going to be like my Father in heaven, these are the people that I need to act and show love to. I need to serve them and act in their best eternal interest. Not necessarily what I think's best, not necessarily what they think's best. I need to act, following God's word, in their best interest. These people were made in the image of God and have immortal souls that need saving. And I may not find it easy but when we go back to Matthew 18 and consider the parable of the two debtors, one who was owed a, whole, owed a whole lot and was forgiven by his master and then turned around and would not forgive his fellow servant who owed him just a little bit. The same principle is what I've got to every day keep in my mind here 
God gave his son to die for me. He showed the greatest love possible when I was not lovable. And now all that is asked of me, and I'll probably find him a lot more lovable once I get to know them, but I need to love my brother and love my fellow man, even the ones that I may find it difficult to do, may not find that natural connection. It may be a little harder to get to know them or whatever, but that is what is asked of me if I am truly, truly to display agape love as our Father and Savior did for us. Then verse 11 Beloved, if God so loved us, so so also we ought to love one another. How? In the manner in which God loved us as we've been looking at, through action, by initiating love and acting in people's best eternal interest. One other passage I want us to look at, and that's John 13, 34, and 35. Where Jesus, as he's preparing his disciples for his crucifixion, getting right up to the day of crucifixion, says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, the whole point of our lesson, that you also love one another. And by this, men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, men will know that you love one another. And sometimes I've looked at that. It's very poor on my part, but sometimes I've looked at that and been a little bit skeptical. Well, will it, will it really stand out? There's some pretty good people over with this group and with that group, and they seem to love each other. And I realize when I'm potentially skeptical about that, once again, I'm probably completely using the wrong definition of love. I'm probably back at, just like we looked at before, I'm going, well, yeah, I love my family. I love my friends. I love those who've been good to me. And yeah, as we've seen, that would not, should not stand out. That's what people do. But what we're looking at here today is true agape love, loving those, taking action, initiating love, yep, not waiting for them to come to me, me going to them and serving them and acting in their best interest. Yes, if I will show true love as our Father has for us, as well as I can represent that, yes, then the world will see the difference. <clears throat> have a bunch of question marks here. We'll look at the time and see if you've got time to go into these various other things, and I do not. And so... I'm going to stop at this point. And as we look over what we've been saying here today, the main theme has been your Father, your Creator, loves you. He has given His Word to direct you in this life to tell you how you, your life should be lived for your own good. He loves you and gave his son to die for you that you might have life with him in eternity. If you have not put Jesus on in baptism, you need to do that. We'll make that opportunity available to you.
If you have started the Christian life and have sinned, you need to repent of that. He is faithful and just and will forgive you. If you have if you're in need of prayers of the congregation, we would be happy to pray for you. If we can in any way assist you in your obedience to the Lord, we'd be happy to do so if you'll come forward as we stand and sing the song that was announced. <laughs>